afternoon. My name is Sheila Lamb, and I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network. For those of you that are not familiar with our organization, the Virginia Small Business Development Center is a partnership program between the U.S. Small Business Administration, George Mason University, and local host institutions throughout Virginia. With 26 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses in their local communities. Our one-on-one -on -one advising services are available at no charge. Today's webinar, Trademark Basics, is presented by the Virginia SBDC Network in collaboration with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. We are recording today's presentation, and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Due to the large number of participants, everyone's microphone is muted and the chat feature is turned off. But if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box. We have also enabled a live transcript function, which you can show or hide via your own meeting controls. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's session, Kyle Ingram. Kyle is an attorney in the Trademarks Customer Outreach Office within the United States Patent and Trademark Office, the USPTO. Prior to this, he worked as a trademark examining attorney for six years. Kyle obtained his Juris Doctorate from the University of Oregon, his master's degree in natural resource management from Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, aka Virginia Tech, and his BA in economics from the University of Virginia. He currently resides in Atlanta, Georgia. Please join me in welcoming Cal Ingram. Thank you very much for that uh, introduction. So uh, let's get the presentation going. Excellent. Uh, as said, I am Kyle Ingram. I'm an attorney with the Trademarks Customer Outreach Office at USPTO. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing trademark basics, what every small business should know now and not later. So an overview of what we're going to discuss today, uh, we'll talk about trademark fundamentals. Uh, we'll talk about the benefits of a federal registration. You know, Why do you even want one of these in the first place? We'll go into some considerations that uh, you should take into account when you're selecting a trademark. We'll talk about filing and registration, and then we'll end with how to find help and the types of resources that are available to you. So trademark fundamentals. Um, I'm sure here in this group, uh, there's a wide variety of experience when it comes to trademarks. Some of you might already own a federally registered trademark, and you've kind of been through this process a little bit before. Some of you might have picked up some odds and ends uh, as you have run your business or uh, you know, gone through educational endeavors. And some of you might just know the word trademark and not really anything else. But regardless of where you are on that spectrum, uh, you are already familiar with trademarks. Right here on the screen, we have a lot of uh, pretty famous trademarks. And when you see these, uh, you immediately associate these trademarks with particular goods and services. So you see those golden arches, boom, you think fast food. You see that cursive font Coca-Cola, boom, you think soft drinks. You see that Apple logo, you think smartphones, you think uh, tablet computers, you think peripherals for personal electronics. And all the other logos here, you're thinking goods and services. But what specifically is a trademark? What's the legal significance of a trademark? So a trademark identifies the source of goods and services and distinguishes those goods and services from those of other parties. In essence, it's, uh, it provides you a legal protection for a brand, for your identity and presence out there in the market. So that's what a trademark is. Real quickly, before we discuss more about what a trademark is, uh, let's talk about what a trademark isn't. Let's clear up some misconceptions. So first, uh, a trademark does not mean that you legally own a word or phrase. It does not mean that you can stop other people from saying that word or phrase. And it does not mean that people owe you money if they say that word or phrase. So those are some common misconceptions when it comes to trademarks. Uh, and we see it come into our agency all the time. Uh, someone's trying to trademark some very common word and they have their, their get rich quick scheme. Um, one in particular I had was a guy who tried to trademark barbecue for sauces. And his idea was, hey, listen, if I get a trademark for barbecue, I'm going to get paid every time someone makes some barbecue sauce. Uh, unfortunately, that's not how trademarks work. So that's not going to be a good source of supplemental income. So if that was your plan coming into this, uh, 
hate to rain on your parade, but that's not what a trademark does. So we put this slide in here uh, just so you're not confused if in the process you encounter the term service mark. So technically, trademark indicates the source of goods or products. Service mark indicates the source of services. Uh, you'll find that even here at the USPTO, we tend to use trademark interchangeably with service mark. But technically, service mark is for services. So, you know, if you're at a party and your friend says, hey, great news, I just registered a trademark for my life coaching services. You can lean in and say, well, actually, you registered a service mark. It's a great way to make friends, I promise. So the three main types of trademarks that we see at the USPTO, brand names, slogans, and logos. So with regard to Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, that's the brand name. It's the real thing. That's your slogan. And right here, the seal with a Coca-Cola bottle and the wording always Coca-Cola, that's a logo. Now a trademark is anything that identifies the source of goods and services. Yeah, you know, there's brand name slogans and logos, but we do have some non-traditional types of marks. We have sound, uh, the NBC chimes, uh, the little drums when you boot up the, uh, the Netflix app. Da -dun. That's a sound mark. Color, the pink of housing insulation. That's a trademark that's owned by Owens, Owens Corning. Um, if you're sitting in your living room and you see a dark brown delivery truck go by, that's a trademark. Dark brown for uh, delivery services. Um, scent and smell. Play-Doh, the smell of Play-Doh. That's a trademark. You know, we've got motion, we've got hologram, uh, and one of the more famous configuration marks, that little bottle in the bottom right. I'm willing to bet if you were at the supermarket and you see that bottle, you don't even have to look at any of the wording on it to know what's in that bottle and where it came from, because that is a Coca-Cola bottle. Now, in terms of uh, what you can and can't register, um, you know, all of this is stuff that you can register as a trademark. You know, you can um, register your business name as a trademark. You don't have to. Uh, a lot of people start out with their business name. But again, all of this stuff is stuff that is potentially registrable as a trademark. So with these knowledge checks, um, I think the nature of this presentation, um, I'm probably just going to read these to you. We don't really have... Uh, the time and bandwidth to do the uh, real-time participation. But does a federally registered trademark mean that you own the word or phrase? No, no, it does not. Uh, what it means is that you have exclusive right to use that word or phrase to indicate the source of your goods and services. So you have the right to use it as the brand name, but you don't own the word or phrase in and of itself. So do you have to use your business name as your trademark? No, you don't have to. Um, a lot of businesses do when they're first starting out, but you know, maybe you have your business name and you want that to be separate from your brand name. People do that all the time. So let's talk about the benefits of having a federally registered trademark. So there's two ways of creating rights. You have common law and then you have federal registration. One of the questions we get all the time is, eh, you know, I think my business is doing fine. I don't really want to expand that much more. Do I have to register my trademark? And the answer to that, no, no, you don't. But if you don't, then your trademark rights are going to be based on common law. So common law rights are created immediately once you start using the trademark in commerce. Once you start using that stuff as your brand name, you have common law rights. The downside is that... Um, in contrast to the rights that you get with a federal registration, you're gonna be limited into the geographic area where the mark's used. So if you know, you're know you using a trademark in Arizona, you're only gonna be protected in Arizona. You're not gonna be protected anywhere else. And that can become a problem if you're looking to expand your business. So with a common law trademark, uh, you only use the TM or the SM next to the mark. Uh, you don't get to use the R in the circle in it that you typically see with a federally registered trademark. Now, your federal rights 
Those are created when you federally register the trademark. And the good thing about this is that there is a legal presumption that you not only own the trademark, but that you have the right to use the trademark in all 50 states and US territories. Now, one of the exceptions to this is if someone has common law rights that they established uh, prior to your use, your federal registration rights, uh, their rights are going to be superior. So, you know, if someone's using a trademark, let's just say cheetah in Arizona, and you're in Florida, and you get a federal registration for cheetah after they're using their, their mark in Arizona, well, you'll still have superior rights everywhere in the country except Arizona because they were actually using it before you. So that's a little bit of the nuance. Um, if there's questions about that later, we can discuss that. But just know that the federal registration rights are going to be a lot broader in terms of where it protects you and the type of protection it gives you. So another benefit is that when you have the federal registration, your registration goes into our register that the public can search. So, you know, if you have your trademark for Cheetah, uh, someone else in New Jersey is thinking about uh, setting up a business and using the trademark Cheetah, they can look in our register and say, oh, I see someone already has that. And that'll save you a lot of time um, in enforcement actions, because now you're, you aren't going to have to go hunt these people down and send them a cease and desist and enforce your trademark rights quite as often as if you were just relying on common law rights. You also can bring legal action concerning trademarks in federal court. So these tend to be more expedited proceedings. The, uh, the judiciary tends to be a lot more knowledgeable in terms of intellectual property. It just tends to be a better proceeding. Uh, if counterfeits are a concern, you can record your registration with Customs and Border Protection, and that allows them to seize any counterfeits at the border, um, protects your brand, protects uh, your profits, protects what you're doing in commerce. And finally, you can use your federal registration as a basis for filing in another country. So if things are going great in the U.S., you're looking to expand, this is a great way to be able to do it. And best of all, you get that R with a circle in it when you have a federal registration. So are you required to register your trademark with a USPTO? No, you are not. Federal registration is a choice. Um, if you're fine with your common law rights, great. Uh, if you want something a, a little bit more for your business, you're looking to grow that business, well, maybe you should consider federally registering your mark. So does registering your trademark give you international protection? No, it does not. Uh, it gives you uh, the presumption of the right to use in the United States and US territories, but it does not give you protection in other countries. Moving on to selecting a trademark. Uh, these are some of the things you should consider when you are selecting the trademark that you would like to register with the USPTO. So the mission of the USPTO is to register any trademark that's eligible for registration. So if you, if you submit something and there's no legal reason you can't get it, well, we're gonna push that on through and make sure that you get that registration. You know, we're not here to throw up any uh, roadblocks or, or burden you with red tape. We want you to get your registration as much as you do. But keep in mind that not every trademark is registrable. There's a lot of reasons that a trademark might not be able to be registered. So what you want is you want to get a trademark that you can register and also protect, um, something that you can enforce against other people who might be infringing on uh, your intellectual property. So as I said, there's a lot of reasons that a uh, trademark may not register. Uh, we're only going to go over the two most common right here, and that is a likelihood of confusion refusal and a descriptiveness refusal. So the first one, likelihood of confusion. Uh, intuitively, you guys probably already understand this. So at the USPTO, we're not going to allow um, an applied for mark to register if there's already something on the register that's too close, that's likely to confuse consumers if they see both of these trademarks out in commerce. And, uh, the way that we determine if something is you know, too close, if it's likely to cause confusion, it's a two-pronged test. 
The first prong is, are the trademarks confusingly similar? And this is just looking at the marks themselves, like the word, the logo, the slogan that you're trying to register. Is that um, confusingly similar with what has already been registered? You know, do they look the same? Do they sound the same? Do they have the same commercial impression? And if they do, we move on to the second prong. Are the goods and services related? And relatedness is a very evidence-based analysis. So what we do as the examining attorneys is the registration's over here. And here's the stuff that the registrant makes. The application, the person who's trying to get their, their mark registered is over here. And here's the stuff they make. So what we do is we go out and we say, hey, are there companies that make this stuff and this stuff under the same brand name? And if there are, if we see this, uh, if we see a lot of examples of this, then the goods and services are related. And in that case, both prongs are met and we would have a likelihood of confusion refusal. Now keep in mind, both prongs have to be met. Um, and you probably already know this. Uh, there are trademarks out there in the wild that are identical and coexist peacefully. Uh, think Dove for soap and shampoo, Dove for chocolate and ice cream. Those are identical trademarks, so they would be confusingly similar. But then we do that second prong of analysis. Are the goods related? Well, do companies that make soap and shampoo typically make chocolate and ice cream? Not that I'm aware of, and I certainly hope they don't start. Um, but because of that, Dove and Dove can coexist peacefully. So let's run through a few quick examples. So let's say the registered trademark is T Marky for pants, and you are applying for T Marky for shirts. Is there a likelihood of confusion here? Prong one, are the marks confusingly similar? Well, in this case, they're identical, so yes. We move on to prong two. Are the goods related? That is, do companies that make pants typically make shirts under the same brand name? Yes, they do. So this would be a likelihood of confusion refusal. Example number two. So you still want T Marky for shirts, but you see on the register T Marky for pants. Is this an issue? Well, first prong, are the marks confusingly similar? Well, they don't necessarily look the same, but they certainly sound the same. So yeah, that's probably gonna be a problem. And as we discussed in the last example, shirts and pants are related goods. So marks are confusingly similar, goods are related. This is probably a likelihood of confusion refusal. What about T Marky for shirts versus T Marky for golf flags? Well, in the last example, we said that prong one, are the marks confusingly similar? That prong is met because they sound alike. You know, they sound either identical or very, very close. Well, what about shirts versus golf flags? Are these related goods? Well, do companies that make golf flags also make shirts? I, I don't know off the top of my head. I can't name anything, but this is where you'd wanna do that research. You'd wanna go out and say, okay, well, let me find a bunch of companies that make golf flags. And then I'll look and see if they also make shirts, you know, maybe Ping, maybe Titleist, Champion, just a couple off the top of my head. Um, and then whatever you find is gonna kind of determine whether or not there's a likelihood of confusion. So I would guess this might be a problem, but again, very evidence-based. So this is why you want to search on the front end of your application. You wanna do what's called a clearance search, uh, just to make sure that there isn't stuff already out there that's going to be too close to what you're doing, that's gonna cause a likelihood of confusion. So definitely search our database. Um, like I said, we have a database of all of the applied for marks and all of the registered trademarks. So you can see the whole world of what's out there. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, we also recommend searching the internet. Uh, you, if you recall, I said, listen, if someone's out there already using the mark that you are applying for or a mark that is confusingly similar, 
with related goods and they were using it before you, they're going to have superior rights to you. So if they haven't filed an application, if they don't have a registration, then you're not going to find them by searching our database. You're going to have to go look on the internet. So that's what we recommend doing, just to make sure you don't uh, encounter any pitfalls with uh, common law rights that you didn't necessarily know about. We also recommend um, a lot of times hiring an attorney to do this search process. So they're going to know um, how to really navigate our system, um, how to use our search language to get the best results possible. Uh, they're going to know how to get into state trademark databases, uh, business name registries, foreign trademark databases, and really navigate the internet to make sure that you're getting the best clearance search you can and you can feel as confident as possible going forward with your application. Now, one final example to kind of highlight the value that an attorney can bring. Let's just say the registered mark is exceed for live plants and you are applying for exceed for agricultural seeds. Now, this one's a little tricky and it sort of highlights, um, it's not always clear cut. So the first prong, are the marks confusingly similar? Exceed versus exceed? Well, they sound alike, but you know, if I'm looking at this and I'm trying to argue that this is okay, I'm gonna say, well, listen, exceed, that's its own word. That's a word in the English language. Exceed, yeah, it kind of points to exceed a little bit, but you know, that's a tip of the hat. That's like a slight connotation in the word. What we're really looking at here is the letter X. And the letter X in, you know, modern culture, it, you know, it means it's something sexy and mysterious and cool, coupled with seed, which that's, those are the goods that I'm making. So this is X seed. I have cool, mysterious, awesome, cutting edge seeds. That's the commercial impression of my mark. So that's the type of argument you would want your attorney to be making for you. Because um, you're trying to get these, these two marks as far apart as possible. You're trying to say these are not confusingly similar. People are not going to get these mixed up. Uh, agricultural seeds and live plants, that's probably related. Again, it's all evidence-based. Um, so this was an actual case. And ultimately, this was refused. And a likelihood of confusion uh, was found here. But I mean, I've seen attorneys argue for cases that are closer than these and win. So you know, that just goes to show you an attorney can provide a lot of value if uh, you're in these situations where it's a little tighter, it's a little closer. Moving on to the uh, merely descriptive refusal. We just finished up with the likelihood of confusion, and now we're moving on to the second most common refusal we get. So I said that a trademark identifies the source of goods and services. Now, if there is a word or a phrase or a slogan that just kind of describes something about the goods, then that's not indicating the source. That's not telling consumers where the stuff came from. It's just describing something about the stuff. For example, if you're looking for potpourri and you see apple pie printed on the bag, you're just looking at that and thinking, okay, well, that's apple pie scented potpourri. You're not thinking, oh, that's apple pie brand potpourri. I wonder what it smells like. So we want to make sure that trademarks are actually identifying the source and goods of services. Um, another key interest uh, in protecting the register from these merely descriptive marks is that we need to make sure all the other businesses that need to use this wording still get to use the wording. Apple pie for potpourri, for example. If we let just one person have apple pie for potpourri, well, then what happens to the 15 other companies that want to make apple pie scented potpourri? Well, suddenly they're not allowed to use the word apple pie. That doesn't really seem fair. That doesn't encourage um, healthy commerce. So that's why we don't let merely descriptive marks on the register, except in limited cases that we'll talk about briefly in a bit. The test here is, does the trademark merely describe the goods and services? It sounds really simple. Um, once you get into examining and you start applying it, it gets a little trickier, but that is the test. So we have this neat little thermometer to kind of show you the spectrum of uh, weak marks to strong marks. 
down here at the bottom, uh, generic marks. These are the types of marks that you will never get registered ever, ever, ever. Uh, up here on top, fanciful and arbitrary marks. These are the strongest marks, and these are never going to run into a uh, likely, I'm oh, sorry, a merely descriptive refusal. So starting at the bottom, the bad stuff, generic terms. So these are the common everyday names for goods and services. Like I said, these are unregisterable. For example, if your goods are dairy-based beverages, you will not be able to register the word milk because milk is a generic term for dairy-based beverages. Similarly, if your goods are sauces, you will not be able to register the word barbecue because barbecue is a common everyday name for a type of sauce. Moving up the, uh, the spectrum, a little bit better, but still not good, uh, descriptive trademarks. So these uh, directly describe something about the goods and services. And these are typically unregisterable on the principal register, uh, except with a showing of acquired distinctiveness. An example of this is Creamy Whip for whipped topping. Creamy Whip isn't a uh, common everyday term for whipped topping, so it's not generic. It's a little better than that, but it still just kind of describes the stuff. Whip, okay, well, that just describes that it's whipped topping. Creamy, okay, well, that just describes the consistency of the stuff. This is merely descriptive. Now, they were able to show acquired distinctiveness. And what that is, is, you know, your mark starts off merely describing the goods themselves or an aspect of those goods. But uh, through diligence and hard work and uh, extensive advertising campaigns and awareness uh, campaigns and what have you, uh, if you have this wording that's merely descriptive, you can ultimately show Sorry, I keep scratching my nose. Uh, pollen is really bad here in Georgia, and it is bothering me. So apologies. Uh, but with regard to Creamy Whip, for example, um, so they were able to show us, hey, listen, we spent all this money on advertising campaigns. Here's all of our advertising. You know, Here we are in you know, magazines and radio and um, TV, and here's our giant display at the grocery store. So when consumers... Uh, of whipped topping come by, they see creamy whip really big on our signs and on our product. Um, and because of that, when people see creamy whip, they no longer think of it as just describing goods. They think of it as a brand name. It's turned that corner. It has acquired distinctiveness. And we said, you know what? You're right. But it's pretty rare for something descriptive like this to acquire distinctiveness. Um, I would just avoid this type of trademark entirely. Um, it's a huge uphill battle for you to ultimately get on the principal register. Finally, we're in the good stuff, suggestive trademarks. So these don't describe an aspect of the goods, they suggest it, and these are great. Think copper tone for suntan lotion. Um, you know, it's not bronze colored skin, which would be descriptive, it's copper tone. It suggests the coppery tone that your skin will take on if you use this suntan lotion product. So that's suggestive, and that's great. Finally, the strongest category, the fanciful and arbitrary. So fanciful trademarks are invented words that have no meaning in any language. So think Xerox for photo photocopiers, um, Pepsi for soft drinks, Finally, we have arbitrary. And these are actual words, but there's no association with the actual goods and services. These are registrable, these are great. Think Apple for computers. Now, if you had fruit or pies, Apple would be generic, maybe merely descriptive. But because apples typically doesn't describe any aspect of a computer, it's an arbitrary trademark and it's good to go. Now, if you're the, uh, the barbecue sauce guy from earlier, yeah, you can't register barbecue for sauces, but if you have a clothing line, for example, and you want the brand name for that clothing line to be barbecue, now that's an arbitrary trademark. That's no longer generic, and that's something you could register. So one little knowledge check to finish this off. Which of these two is registrable? Bicycle for bicycles or bicycle for playing cards? 
I'm sure you all realize bicycle for playing cards is arbitrary. That's a strong mark and that's registrable. Whereas bicycle for bicycles is generic and that's no good. You're never gonna get that on the register. So those are the two um, biggest refusals that we encounter uh, here at the agency. And those are, you know, there's a lot of things you should be on the lookout for. And if you hire an attorney to help you through the process, they can certainly guide you around all those potential pitfalls. But, you know, if you're going to set out on your own, those are the two biggest ones you want to be on the lookout for, the likelihood of confusion and the merely descriptive. So moving on to filing and registration. This is the basic registration process. So you file your application. An examining attorney looks at it, um, assuming there either aren't any issues with it or any issues that you have ultimately get ironed out through um, examiner's amendments or office actions, that application moves on to publication. And that's when we say, hey, all right, public, 30 days. Anyone who has an issue with this, let us know now. And sometimes people oppose. That's when you'll see uh, common law trademark holders kind of come out of the woodwork and say, hey, you know, I'm out here in um, Washington state and, you know, you're in Florida, so I didn't know you were doing this, but yeah, I've been using this longer than you. I take issue with this um, registering. Typically that doesn't happen. Assuming that doesn't happen, once you show us that you're actually using your applied for trademark in commerce with the goods and services you say you're using it with, you get your registration. Now, remember, not every trademark registers. Um, it's important to understand the process and all the specifics of the application before filing, because ultimately, if your application hits a snag or there's a legal reason it can't be registered, um, I'm sorry, it doesn't get registered uh, and you don't get your filing feedback. But one thing to clarify, we're not telling you you can't use that as your brand name. We're not telling you to stop using this as your brand name, stop using it as a source indicator. All we're saying is, hey, for these legal reasons, we can't extend to you the benefits associated with a uh, federally registered trademark. So that's something a lot of people get mixed up. Um, just letting you know, we can't tell you to stop using it. Though, if we do refuse your trademark, that might be a sign that there could be trouble if you're looking to grow your brand. So when you file, you file using the Trademark Electronic Application System, or TEAS. So there's two filing options. There's the TEAS Plus and the TEAS Standard. The TEAS Plus is $250 per international class. TEAS Standard is $350 per international class. Um, just to clarify this, international class um, just means the category of goods and services. So the international aspect of it is just that a bunch of countries got together and they decided where all the stuff should go. So they said, okay, clothing should go in class 25. Jewelry should go in class 14. Um, chemicals should go in class one, that type of thing. So when we say international class, that's what we mean by it. It's not, there's nothing international about your application. Uh, so the difference between T's plus and T's standard, why the T's plus is a little cheaper is because there's more requirements on the front end when you submit your application. Uh, most notably that when you identify the goods and services that you're using your trademark with, you have to select them from our ID manual. Now, I know that seems a little constricting, but uh, our ID manual is huge. There are a lot of entries in there that have blanks that you can fill in additional wording as needed. And in the six and a half years I was an examining attorney, uh, I think there were two people out of the thousands uh, of applications that didn't already have their stuff in the ID manual. So more likely than not, uh, you'll be fine picking something out of the ID manual. I recommend it because you can save yourself an extra hundred bucks per class. And ultimately, if you goof it up, uh, don't get it quite right, your application doesn't get kicked back or abandoned. Uh, you just get bumped down to the T standard $350 per international class. So you're really no worse off than you were before. Um, try and save yourself a hundred bucks. You know, that's a dinner somewhere nice. 
So again, the fee is determined by how many classes that you include in the application. So um, if you're doing clothing and you're doing 400 different clothing items, that's still one class. So that's still the 250 for T's plus. If you're doing clothing and jewelry and you have only two clothing items and one jewelry item, that's still gonna be 500 because those are two different classes. Now it's not gonna be that way forever. Um, we're going to be implementing a new system, I think sometime next year that changes that. But for now, that's how the fees are calculated. So the application requirements, you have to give us a clear drawing of the trademark. Now a drawing, that doesn't mean you know a hand drawing. The drawing just refers to the image of the trademark itself. You have to give us a listing of the goods and services that you're using with the trademark. You have to give us a filing basis for each good or service. And the filing basis is just the reason um, that you're able to get in the door. Uh, we have a 1A filing basis. Uh, that's you saying, hey, I'm already using this trademark in commerce. Here's proof of me using this trademark in commerce. Then we have 1B, which is intent to use, which is, hey, I'm not using it yet, but uh, it's on the horizon. I have a uh, bona fide intent to use this trademark, just haven't gotten off the ground just yet. So those are the two main filing bases. You have to specify which one you are. You have to give us contact information for the owner and you have to submit that filing fee that we discussed. So common bases for refusal, we discuss the likelihood of confusion and the merely descriptive. There's also geographically descriptive of the origin of the goods and services or uh, the origin of some of the components of the goods and services. You can kind of think of this as a subset of merely descriptive in the sense that, you know, people aren't going to think of it as the brand name. They're just thinking of this as, okay, you're telling me where it came from. Uh, we also have specimen refusals. That is, um, the specimen is when you show us that you're actually using this trademark in commerce, you know, that you're out there in the world, you know, you're providing these services, you're selling these goods that you tell us that you're selling and providing. Um, and then you show us that trademark used in connection with them, showing that, okay, yeah, this is a brand name. People are going to look at this as a source indicator. We're good. Um, a lot of times when people submit specimens, uh, they're not really showing that they're using their trademark as a brand name or they're showing us goods and services that aren't in the application. So that's a specimen refusal. And finally, a trademark used in ornamental manner. Uh, that is, you know, as we said, trademarks have to serve as a brand name, identify the source of goods and services. Uh, if it's used in a way that's purely decorative, like really big on the front of a shirt where it looks like it's just the artwork of a shirt, um, that's not showing a brand name. That's just serving as the art. That's serving as ornamentation of the goods. And that is another refusal. Again, there's a lot more that aren't on this list, but that's a good list. So your registration responsibilities. Now, you have to enforce your own trademark rights. We don't have any enforcement arm of our agency. So uh, if you have that registration, that certainly supports and validates a cease and desist letter, and it's going to help you along the way, but we don't actually go out there and hunt down someone who might be infringing on your, uh, your trademark. The only thing that we do is if you register your trademark and someone else is applying to register a trademark that's confusingly similar, that's likely to cause confusion among consumers, we will refuse their application. Um, Um, yeah, so that's going to be our only enforcement. So you can use your registration to sue an infringing user, but here's the thing. Once you register, uh, you have to file post-registration documents with the USPTO. It's like once it registers, it, you don't own it forever with nothing left to do. Between years five and six, you have to file something. And between years nine and 10, you have to file something. And then every 10 years after that. So there are still some responsibilities after your trademark registers. So quick knowledge check. Are you guaranteed registration of your trademark? No, you're not. 
if your trademark registers, do you have to do anything to keep your registration alive? Yes, as I said, you have to submit those filings. Uh, you have to keep using the trademark. Uh, if you stop using the trademark for a considerable length of time, well, you don't really have those trademark rights anymore. Once you stop using it, that's it. Now, there's certain periods of time that it's okay, that are excusable non-use. Um, that's a little more nuanced, and quite frankly, uh, you're not going to run into that until well after your trademark registers. So uh, if I were to recommend prioritizing anything, it wouldn't be the post-registration stuff. It would be taking care of everything on the front end to make sure you get that registration in the first place. So how to find help. Uh, unfortunately, this is the world we live in. There are a lot of people out there looking to scam you and take your money. Uh, we have some examples of the scams here, uh, what you can do to protect yourself here on this website. But generally, uh, if someone's calling you asking for money, it's a scam. Um, we have a lot of people that pretend to be the USPTO and they'll say, oh, hey, um, you know, you had this that was wrong with your application and it's going to abandon unless you send $300 for the re-examination fee. We are never going to contact you directly and say, hey, give us money. If you owe additional money, that's going to come in the form of an office action. And that office action is going to be part of the official record um, and our trademark status and document retrieval system. That's TSDR. And you go in there and you look to see if officially the USPTO has um, said that you owe more money. And if they have, respond to that office action. Never respond to someone who just calls you and says, hey, you owe us more money. Uh, filing firms. Beware of filing firms. These are the ones that say, hey, you know, you give us $300 and we can guarantee you a registration. That's, that's not the case. Uh, no one can guarantee a registration. And the fees are, as we said before, $250 per class for T's plus, $350 for T's standard. If someone's telling you something different, they're trying to sell you something. Uh, we also have a lot of solicitations. Uh, some of these are just companies trying to drum up business. Some of those sol solicitations are misleading and scams. Um, we're doing our best to educate people on how to differentiate between the two. Unfortunately, as I said before, we don't really have an enforcement arm. We can't send anyone after the bad guys. So all we can really do is educate and uh, inform law enforcement agencies and hope that they go after some of the bad guys. So this is our website. There are a ton of really great resources there. It's recently been revamped. If you want to learn about trademarks, go to the Trademarks tab, and you'll see a bunch of resources under there. We have trademark videos. Uh, we're currently in the process of revamping a lot of these. So uh, there may not be as much here as there used to be, um, but there's still some good stuff there. And this is, a, um, this is a good resource right here. I always recommend this one. This is the Trademark Basics Registration Toolkit. And if you can either, you can either scan that QR code or just go to our website and look up uh, Registration Toolkit. It'll kind of take you through everything that we've discussed today. And there's a lot of embedded links there that will take you to more in-depth resources. So if you're reading about likelihood of confusion and you want to learn more, you can click on stuff in there and it'll take you where you want to go. So highly recommend that resource. I also recommend the Trademark Basics Bootcamp. So this is an eight-week course. We do one class every week. Uh, it's about an hour long, followed by... 20 minutes of Q&A uh, live with trademarks experts. So, you know, if you have questions, if you want to see, you know, real-time demonstrations of how this stuff works, that is a fantastic resource. We've had people go through the boot camp and every week advance their application a little bit more. And on the final week, they hit submit and uh, file their application and got their trademark. This is an IP identifier. Um, if you don't know what it is you have, do I have a patent? Do I have a trademark? Do I have a copyright? This will kind of lead you through some questions and help you figure that out. We have free services here. Uh, this is good if you're looking for um, a pro bono legal work. So if you are 
wanting to get the services of an attorney, but maybe you don't have that built into your budget, or maybe you just don't want to pay for an attorney, a lot of law schools will have clinics where um, law students will provide you with legal services, obviously under the supervision of a licensed attorney who's double and triple checking their work. Um, that's a great way to go about that too. We've had a lot of success with that. We also have the Trademark Assistance Center. And this is uh, the number you can call. It's the main support center for all of our trademark customers. They can't answer legal questions. So, you know, if you get an office action that says, hey, there's a likelihood of confusion and you call them up and you say, hey, how should I respond to this? They're not gonna be able to help, but they can help you procedurally. Uh, they can help you with um, what's in the record. Uh, if you have received suspicious correspondence, they're a great uh, place to call and say, hey, is this legit? Did I actually get this refused? Do I actually owe extra money for this? They can help you out with that. So as a reminder, USPTO does not provide legal advice. Uh, we don't enforce your legal rights, and we unfortunately cannot recommend specific private attorneys. So with that, I think we'll open it up to questions. Sorry about that. So it looks like Gotham has answered all the questions so far um, in the background, but if there are any other questions you, you all have, we have Kyle live right now to, to help out. So please drop them in the Q&A box and we'll go ahead and um, get those answered for you. We have about 10 minutes. Excellent. And I apologize for when I stopped in the middle of the presentation. We have workers here who are doing work on our building. Um, I live in a condo building and one of them decided to scale the barbed wire fence and I was just looking at him going, oh, no, am I going to have to call an ambulance here? So that's what that was. Apologize for it. Let's see. Can we hear me? Okay, I'm gonna keep going as though we can hear me. Uh, can you put up the website for the course again? Yes, give me one second. So I assume you mean the boot camp. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what just happened, but I got kicked off. I'm back. <laughs> no worries. Um, so this is the website for the boot camp. Um, I assume that's what we were talking about. Uh, someone had asked, can you trademark slogans? Uh, I don't know where that went, but yes, you can. You absolutely can. That's one of the most common, uh, commonly trademarked uh, pieces of material that we see here at the agency. Uh, was it Kristen that asked that question? Do you see concept. that? Yes. Um, so you would, you wouldn't trademark a concept. Um, I, I don't think, uh, that would be something that you would be able to register as a trademark. Uh, if you were trying to register the mandala of wellness and use that as a brand name for some type of services that you're providing, whether that's like wellness coaching or what have you, that's more in line of what is registrable as a trademark. So um, like concepts and ideas in and of themselves are not something that's gonna be protected uh, with trademark. So the difference between trademark and copyright, uh, trademark protects your brand name, it protects the source indicator. Um, copyright protects creative works. And there's a, a whole, um, slew of rights that come along with that. Now you do see them intersect sometimes. Uh, for example, if there's a creative work, like a design or a logo or like a character that's really artistic, that is going to be protected via copyright. Uh, think like Super Mario, like, you know, the draw, like Super Mario as a character is a copyright, but uh, 
through the prolific usage of Super Mario in all of Nintendo's games, Super Mario has come to also be a source identifier, kind of a brand. So if you see a game that has a little Super Mario logo on it, you still know that it came from Nintendo. So it is a trademark in that regard, but in the sense that it's also a creative work, it's a copyright in that regard. Let's see, going through these questions. Yeah, sorry, I, since I got kicked out, I'm not sure ah, what you have handled. <laughs> no worries. Um, so Kristen, it's not the name of your business, but a system you use for creating protocols and workshops. So again, I mean, that's going to depend on how it's being used um, for consumers. How are customers interacting with it? Is it, if it's a brand name, great, that's good. If it's just, if it's sort of an internal process, if it's an ethos that you think about as you're creating things, that's not going to be a trademark. Company is in business and actively using a mark and does not plan to expand outside their state. What would be the advantages to federal registration in addition to the common law protections they already enjoy? Um, if you're not planning on expanding outside of your state at all, um, I'm trying to think of something that's like really local. Uh, let's just say a lawn care company, for example. So if you run a lawn care company and you only service um, the lawns in a certain county of a certain state, well, you know, um, maybe you're fine with common law. I mean, maybe you want to consider registering your trademark with um, a, a state database. Uh, one of the benefits that you would get with a federal registration is that it would put anyone on notice that you are actually using this mark in your state. Um, but well, you have to keep in mind that there is an interstate commerce aspect to federal trademarks. So you would have to be using it in some regard in interstate commerce. Uh, I don't want to confuse you with all the case law. There's a lot of nuance to it. But if this were truly, really and truly only local and in no way touched on the commerce of any other state, then yeah, you would be fine with uh, common law or a state trademark. So anonymous attendee, the free service. Um, Yes, they can help with the registration of trademarks. Um, so what that is, is I can pull this back real quick. Or they forward. Yeah, right there. Uh, free services. So if you go there, um, what's going to happen is uh, you'll find a list of law schools that provide uh, clinics for trademarks. And uh, some of them have different criteria that you have to meet in order to participate. But what will happen is if you get selected for those clinics, and sometimes there's a really long wait list. So a lot of times you have to weigh, well, is it worth the wait? Or do I just want to spend the money up front um, and get the, get the ball rolling right now? Um, but yeah, so they'll pair you up with a law student um, who is working under the supervision of an attorney. And they'll help you through that registration process. If your business is more service-based, not goods, would you do more of a service mark? Yeah, so um, the only difference between trademark and service mark, it's exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same process. Um, sorry, I didn't mean to confuse you with that. Uh, it's just a technical terminology. Uh, so if you're providing services, you know, you would technically be registering a service mark, but you can call it a trademark. You can call it a trademark all day long. You can call it a trademark in your filings. No one's going to hassle you over it. Um, it's it's a trademark, but you know, technically it's a service mark. That's just um, if you want to be pedantic, I guess. If you want to be precise with your language, you can call it that. Can an online program obtain international copyright so that the information simply can't? So that's going to be more of a copyrights question. Um, we are uh, trademarks people, so I. I don't think I can really help you with that. Uh, there are a lot of good resources online. If you go to the Copyright Office, they have circulars. Um, you can look into that. Um, I honestly, I can't really help you in terms of um, an online program obtaining international copyrights. So now on to Anita. 
if I have one business that offers travel planning, but also sells body butters and scented oils under the same business name, how much would a trademark cost? Would it be one, two, or three? Um, excellent. So uh, you are charged per international class. So if you're doing travel planning, uh, that's going to be, boy, I want to say 43, but don't quote me on that. Um, we have the uh, trademark ID manual. And if you go in there, you can just start typing things in the field and figuring out where your stuff goes. But let's just say that's 43. Uh, body butters and scented oils, let's say that's class three. So if you have two classes there and you file a T's plus, you're looking at $500. Um, for every additional class of goods uh, or services, that's gonna be one more instance of that fee. Okay, I'm looking at these, I think more are popping up. Let's see. So if your business is more service-based, not goods, would you do more of a, okay, no, that already was there. I'll go with Delinda's here. The USPA deter USPTO determines the number of classes. Is that true? Um, I mean, we ultimately look at your ID and determine how many classes there are. But uh, on the front end, you probably want to select your classes. Uh, go through the ID manual, figure out what it is you do. So for example, if you do um, scented candles uh, and you wanna do t-shirts, look in the ID manual and figure out yourself the number of classes so that when you file, you have that already broken down for us. Um, that's gonna get you your T's plus, your lower fee, your $250 per class. If you just lump everything together, which some people do, they just write a big paragraph of everything they think they're gonna do. Um, that takes a long time to unfurl all of that. And then on our end, we decide, okay, well, this goes in this class and we pick everything out. Uh, that ends up costing you more money and taking a lot more time because ultimately, you know, you're taking up more time from our attorneys. So you clean it up on the front end. We give you that sweet discount. So small business developing a podcast. These will be separate entities and treated as such. Okay, so you want a logo for a podcast and something else. Uh, so the filing fees, again, uh, it's going to be $250 per class with T's plus, $350 per class with T's standard. Um, and you can do as many classes as you want in a single application. It's just going to be, you know, boom, $250 per all the way down. Uh, you know, we have people who come in, they're like, listen, I'm going to blast all sorts of swag out here. I'm doing a podcast. I'm doing keychains, mugs, t-shirts, music production, um, live music, blah, blah, blah. And they'll come in for eight or nine classes. And that's totally fine. But, you know, we do need a fee for every class. So we have another anonymous. Currently have a trademark in class 16 for books. Okay process of writing a memoir and we'll discuss the business to some degree. Is it feasible to cite the mark in the book and does it become a copyright issue now that it's part? Um, that's going to be a little beyond the scope of what we can answer. Um, I, don't, I don't know how you would cite the mark. Uh, it does sound like this is more of a copyrights concern. If you go to their website, uh, they have some circulars that, that could help you out. I think they're working on a uh, uh, copyrights basics. It's similar in structure to this course, uh, but it would pertain to copyrights. So I'm sorry, anonymous attendee, uh, I can't really help you with a copyrights question. So we are at one. I'll see if I get one more. Um, and then if not, okay, here we go. So would it be advisable to file a trademark for a Christmas tree, a drawing of a tree and facts? So this is getting a little bit into uh, legal advice, which um, we can't provide. So, you know, if uh, Fox, 
hey, I mean, look, it could have been a fax machine. I've seen weirder trademarks. Um, so, yeah, I mean, this is certainly something that uh, you could be using as your brand or your logo for a Christmas tree farm. Um, if you're concerned about protecting that IP and protecting that so that someone else with uh, similar services doesn't start using your logo, then I would certainly advise um, getting that protection with a uh, trademark. Okay, what happens if you only register one class for a trademark? Um, right now you're doing travel, but you're looking to expand to body butter. So if you get that application in, uh, you register for the travel consulting. That's great, you're protected in that. Um, you're not gonna be protected with body butters. So if someone else comes in and says, hey, I like this mark, I'm gonna start doing body butters with it. They're gonna beat you to the punch and they're gonna have superior rights in that. Uh, what we do offer is when I discussed the filing bases before, so you have um, use-based and intent to use. Intent to use is kind of there for people who are in your situation where you know you're looking to spin this business up in the near future, but you're not doing it just yet. So you file that application, you secure your place in line so that if someone else comes in and says, hey, I want this trademark, well, no, you beat them in line. So that's one thing that a lot of businesses will do if they know that they're going to be expanding their business in the future. Uh, they'll file that 1B intent to use application. Okay, Kyle. Yeah. I'm on it. I've been kicked off three times. <laughs> I don't know what's <laughs> going on here. Um, but I don't know if you hit this last one. Um, I had directed someone to the Virginia SPD website for trademarks basics, but you I think you mentioned a boot camp. Do you have a link? That must yes. be through the USPTO. And I apologize, I was leading you up. We have trademark basics webinars on our site, but we don't have this boot camp. So if you could provide that and we've gone over time, I'll get us wrapped up here after that. So if you go to, I'll show you. This uh, trademark basics toolkit right here, there are embedded links for all of the boot camp right. sessions. Right. And everyone will get a copy of these slides, so you'll have that easy to use. Um, so I think I'm going to go ahead and get us wrapped up. Um, since right. we've gone a little over time here, I appreciate everyone being here. Um, and Kyle, thanks for reading the questions. Sorry, I I, I put all that work on you when I kept no worries connection. So I'm going to go ahead before I get kicked off again. And um, I want to thank you. I want to thank um, Gotham for all his help and the background answering questions. And I would like to thank everyone who attended today. Um, you all will receive a, an email with a link to the recording and to the slides. If you would like to sign up for upcoming webinars or access recorded webinars, please visit virginiasbdc.org forward slash training. These resources are designed to be used in collaboration with your local SBDC advisors. You can sign up for a free and confidential session by emailing help at virginiasbdc.org or via our website. We hope to see you at our next session. Take care, everyone.